help us and grant us listening ears and obedient heart. For we ask all these things in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Portman. And now we'll um, ask our brother Mike to give us what is on his heart for this evening. And uh, Mike, you have um, potentially more than an hour, if you like. We we tend not to be asking questions nowadays in Bible studies. We're very happy to let the speaker speak. So however long you need, we will be your, your willing listeners. Okay, well, thank you. And it's a joy to be with you, uh, at least through this technology. And I'd like you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Psalms and the second Psalm, Psalm 2. As I understand, you're about to enter into a study on the Messianic Psalms. This is a good place to begin. And so I'm going to read the entire Psalm, verses 1 through 12. And it is uh, going to be read from the authorized version, the King James Version. Hopefully you'll be able to follow along with me as I read it. It begins this way. It says in verse 1, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us uh, this, this evening. So we're thinking about um, the answer of the Holy Trinity to the anarchy of man. Basically, that's kind of a, a, a way to look at this now, just to remind you that this is a psalm we're going to read, uh, learn from the book of Acts, that it's a psalm of David, even though it's not uh, got that inscription on it here in the Old Testament. But the New Testament affirms that this is a Davidic psalm. And so that means that it was written a thousand years prior to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem in Judea. And so it's always interesting to study these messianic psalms, especially the ones written by David, because it just, again, is one of the affirmations uh, to us of the, the accuracy of the word of God that details are given concerning the Messiah, concerning who he was, his sufferings, uh, his future glory, a thousand years before he was actually born uh, in Bethlehem of Judea. So it's just one of those affirming things. So we said it's known as a messianic psalm. Now, how do we know uh, that there are psalms that are written about Messiah? How do we really know that? Well, let's look uh, to the uh, gospel of Luke just for a moment and a very familiar passage Luke's gospel and chapter 24 where we have it from the lips of the savior himself affirming to us uh, that some of the psalms speak to us concerning him and so in Luke's gospel chapter 24 and verse 44 it says uh, this, it says, he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And so we know that there were some of the Psalms that directly spoke about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe that this is one of them. So how do we know 
which Psalms are messianic? And the answer is very simple. The New Testament generally applies the Psalms to Christ and expounds them for us. Now, there are three messianic Psalms that do not have New Testament verification, but it, it's commonly believed that these three Psalms, uh, even though there's no New Testament verification that they are messianic, really do belong in that collection that we call the messianic Psalms. And I'm just going to mention them uh, and kind of just briefly why they should be in the messianic Psalms. One is Psalm 24, uh, which asks the question, who is the king of glory? And of course, the answer is very obvious. Who the king of glory is, is the Lord Jesus. And so Psalm 24 would be considered to be a messianic psalm, even though there's no New Testament affirmation of that. Psalm 72 also would be uh, a messianic psalm speaking about the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. And a very delightful psalm as well, speaking of the extent of the millennium, uh, where to what extent his reign will go, uh, how people will come and bring gifts to him, all this kind of thing. Wonderful psalm. And then well, the last one is Psalm 89, where it talks about the, the Davidic covenant. And we do know that the Davidic covenant, as all the covenants really, will find their fulfillment in the person of Christ. Uh, you see, uh, in a sense, all the promises of God and these covenants, these covenantal promises, all the covenant promises, Scripture tells us, are in him, the Lord Jesus, yea and amen. So they all ultimately find their fulfillment in the person and work of Christ. He will bring about the Davidic covenant in its fullness. And so these are all clearly messianic, yet not mentioned specifically uh, by the New Testament writers. But when it comes to Psalm 2, we have no question at all. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Psalm 2 will be mentioned seven times in the New Testament, quoted seven times in the New Testament, always in connection with the Lord Jesus. We'll look at some of those references uh, as we study together today. But I want to just begin by uh, maybe making perhaps an obvious comment, but uh, many believe, and I'm one of them, that actually Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 really go together. And so Psalm 1 begins with what we call a beatitude. Blessed is the man. And Psalm 2 ends with a beatitude. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him, right there in verse 12 of Psalm 2. And so many believe that there's a connection between the two Psalms. And I, I really believe the connection is very clear. And what it's telling us is this. The perfect man that's described for us in Psalm 1, is the powerful king who is revealed to us in Psalm 2. This blessed man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful, but delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. Whatever he doeth shall prosper. This evergreen man, this, this fruitful man, this perfect man described in Psalm 1 is indeed the powerful king that we're going to be looking at here in Psalm 2. In fact, many have suggested that the obedience of the former qualifies him for the authority of the latter. Uh, this Psalm 1 that talks about his uh, devotion to obedience to the word of God, to its very letter, uh, that's what qualifies him. And of course, that would take us uh, certainly in our minds uh, to Philippians chapter 2 about the, the one who uh, was obedient uh, in every way, even to death, the death of the cross. And as a result of that, God has highly exalted him, given him that name, which is above every name. And so certainly you have that idea. Psalm 1 the perfect obedience of the perfect man. And now Psalm 2, the one who is exalted, who is going to be the king of, uh, who reigns over the earth. Psalm 1, he's occupied with a book and a tree and a river. Three amazing things. Uh, the, the, the law of the Lord, that book, uh, the tree, uh, he's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And then, of course, the river there. Of course, all those things would speak to us 
beautifully of the Lord Jesus, the one who went to the tree and out of him out of how came these living waters uh, as a result of his uh, his obedience to the cross. And so certainly we want to just keep those thoughts in mind. When we look at Psalm 2, it's a very action-packed psalm. There's all kinds of things going on. There's there's riots. There's uh, there's various acti- actors. There's armies on the move. There's uh, there's councils of war uh, and and various events taking place. And so, uh, very very active psalm. We're going to see a lot of uh, events going on. Uh, we'll be able to relate this psalm, I think, very much to the day in which we find ourselves. Also, we, we mentioned that uh, w- we have plenty of New Testament verification that this is a messianic psalm. I said it's mentioned seven times in uh, the uh, New Testament. And those seven references, if you want to write them down, it's found in Acts 4. We'll, we'll take a moment to look at Acts 4, verses 24 through 27. It's found in Hebrews 13. Uh, sorry, Acts thirteen verse thirty three. Acts thirteen verse thirty three. Uh, we'll make a we'll take a look at that reference as well, and then it's found in the Epistle to the Hebrews in Hebrews one and verse five, and chapter five and verse five. And then the Book of Revelation will mention Psalm two on three occasions: chapter two verse twenty seven, chapter twelve verse five, chapter nineteen and verse. 15. And if you're not good at note taking, I'll happily send a copy of my notes to Alistair if anybody would like to uh, get them who didn't get them down quick enough. Not only is this a messianic psalm, it's considered to be a royal psalm. There were there were certain royal psalms that were used by the Davidic kings. Uh, I'll mention some of the other royal psalms, uh, Psalm 18, Psalms 20 through 21, Psalm 45, Psalm 72, 89, 101, 110, 132, 144. So there are, there are these uh, what we call royal psalms. And the idea is that the contents of these royal psalms describe the celebrations as the coronation takes place of the Davidic king despite opposition by rebellious people in surrounding territories. So it's good to kind of keep in mind the original context. Yes, this this is really a, the messianic psalm, but there was a, a real event that kind of caused this psalm to be written. And it was written in rene- re- re- uh, respect of the coronation of the descendants of David and uh, the opposition of surrounding nations. Of course, there's always been opposition of surrounding nations to Israel's existence and to their rulers. And so that's kind of a little bit of the background. Now, this psalm divides into four stanzas, uh, as we often have, of course, remember the, the psalms were the hymn, was the hymn book of the Old Testament. And this hymn book of the Old Testament, um, it, they were psalms were written to be sung. Usually, uh, they're written to be accompanied by various musical instruments or sung at a certain tone or whatever. And so, just like our hymn book, we have stanzas. So, in this psalm, there are four stanzas, and very, very nicely from our perspective. These four stanzas, stanzas in a 12-verse psalm all divide into three verses. And so verses 1 through 3 would comprise the first stanza of the psalm. And in each stanza, there are different people who are speaking. And so that's how we're able to identify which stanza is which. And in verses one through three, it's the people who are speaking, the heathen who are raging, the people who are imagining a vain king, the kings of the earth who are setting themselves, the rulers taking counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And uh, what are they what are they speaking? What's their message? Well, it's one of rejection. 
They do not want restraining influence from God's king. Let's break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. So very simple. Verses one through three, the people speak a message of rejection. In verse four through six, I want to suggest to you, we said this is the answer of the Holy Trinity to the rebellion of man. And so in verse one through three, we've got man's rejection. We, it's basically, you want to summarize one through three, I could put it in New Testament language. We will not have this man to reign over us. <laughs> That's the message of verses one through three. Well, what does, what does the father have to say about that? Well, in verses four through six, he has a message. He that sits in the heavens, who would that be? Uh, that's the Father. He's laughing. Uh, the Lord shall have them in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So the Father speaks and his message is this. You rejected my son. You said you will not have this man to reign over you. But I'm telling you, he will return. And he will indeed be set on that holy hill of Zion. And isn't it wonderful that in the very place of the rejection of the Savior is going to be the place of his vindication. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And then verses 7 through 9, we have the Son himself speaking. Uh, this is the words of Messiah. And uh, what is he saying? I'll declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. The uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And so we would say uh, the son speaks and he talks of his reign. I'm going to enter into the inheritance. The uttermost parts of the earth is going to be my possession. As we often sing, Jesus shall reign where'er the son doth his successive journeys run. He will reign. And then the final section, verses uh, uh, 10 through 12 it's the Holy Spirit speaking and he has a message to these kings be wise now therefore O ye kings be instructed you judges of the earth serve the Lord with fear rejoice with trembling kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little blessed are all they that put their trust in him and the Holy Spirit remonstrates with men. He, he, he pleads with men to kiss the Son. Give your allegiance to the Son. Do not resist God's ultimate purpose for his Son. Also, it has been said, and again, I acknowledge lots of help here. Uh, we're all gleaners. I uh, want to suggest, if you want to have a good grasp of Messianic Psalms, Tiernis Wilson's marvelous book on the Messianic Psalms. Very helpful. Jim Flanagan uh, in What the Bible Teaches, very helpful on the Messianic Psalms. Uh, lots of good resources out there that I would mention before you that I've gleaned from, and I'm sure many others have too. And so in verse uh, two, in each of these um, uh, stanzas, there is a Messianic title as well. And so, for instance, in verse two, it talks about his anointed. The kings of the earth set themselves the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. Of course, that word anointed, that's where we get our word Christ or in the Hebrew, Meshach or Messiah, right? And so it's a very messianic title against the Lord and his Messiah. That's how you could write it or against the Lord and his Christ, the anointed one. And so that's the meaning of the word anointed there. Uh, second stanza. He's, I've set my king, verse 6, on my holy hill of Zion. The one who is the Christ is the king. And who is this Christ? Who is this king? Well, the next messianic title is in verse 7. And we'll explain why this is a messianic title when we go into more detail with verse 7. But it's the title of my son. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And we'll see this term, my son. So he's the anointed, he's my king, he's my son. And then in verse 11, he is the Lord. He's, he's actually uh, Jehovah God, walking among men. Serve the Lord, serve 
Yahweh with fear, serve Jehovah with fear, rejoice with trembling, verse 11. Again, another title of Messiah. So let's get down to well, having done a kind of little bit of an overview of these four stanzas and what each one is dealing with. Let's get into the actual text itself. So we begin with verses one through three, the voice of rebellion, man in revolt, the people speaking. Why do the heathen rage that people imagine a vain thing? Kings of the earth set themselves, rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointing, anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. Now, this psalm uh, is, we've already mentioned, applied by Peter uh, in Acts chapter 4 to speak at least in part to the initial rejection of the Messiah. And so I'd like us to just take a minute to look there, please. Let's go to Acts chapter 4. And we're going to read a couple of verses there in verses 27 and 28. Just seeing how this psalm is used in the New Testament. Of course, the, the context is uh, the apostles, uh, particularly Peter and John, have been told not to preach in this name. Uh, they've been uh, threatened uh, that if they continue to preach in his name, uh, that they're going to suffer. Uh, they're going to be arrested and all of these various things. And when they're let go after this warning, uh, they go to their, verse 23, being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And then as Peter relates what's going on, this opposition, I mean, they're, they're being opposed just by preaching about Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, and there, there's tremendous kickback, there's tremendous opposition to them, as there is today, often in the world, to the preaching of the message of the cross. And so as, as he thinks about this, let's, we'll break in in verse uh, 25, it says, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? This is, by the way, how we know David is the author. Okay, doesn't tell us in Psalm 2, but as Peter is moved by the Holy Spirit, he tells us that the actual human author of Psalm 2, as he was moved by the Spirit, was none other than David, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? The people imagine a vain things vain things the kings of the earth stood up and rulers were gathered together against the lord and against his christ so now he's going to at least apply it and say uh, at least partially uh, this psalm had some measure of fulfillment in the crucifixion of christ because he says for of a truth against thy holy child jesus whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And so, again, just a little bit of irony there that these individuals were actually fulfilling scripture, even though they were unaware of it. Isn't that amazing how they were fulfilling the very scriptures that had been written a thousand years before, uh, at least in a measure. And so how does he apply all this? Of course, we're going to say there is a yet future unfulfilled aspect to this psalm. That's why it's mentioned again in psalm, uh, Revelation 2, uh, verse 7, 27, and Revelation 19, verse 15, because there's aspects of this psalm that are yet to find their fulfillment. We're going to think about that uh, as we proceed. But how does Peter apply the psalm? Well, he talks about the kings of the earth in the psalm. So who was one of the kings of the earth? Well, he mentions Herod, both Herod. And then he says, well, uh, what about the rulers? Uh, the rulers were gathered together. Who was one of the rulers? Well, he says, here's an example, Pontius Pilate. And then he, he talks about the heathen. Why did the heathen rage? Well, who are the heathen? Well, he says, um, with the Gentiles, verse 27. And then uh, he goes on and he, he talks not about just about the heathen, 
uh, but he also talks about the people imagine a vain thing. Who are these people that are imagine a vain thing? Well, again, he tells us who they are. The people of Israel were gathered together. So he equated not only the rejection of Christ at his first advent, but also the current opposition that he and John had just experienced to this continual opposition to God and his anointed by men. It hasn't ended with the crucifixion. Uh, it's going on even in Peter's day. It's going on in our day. It will continue to go on until the Lord finally puts down man's rebellion at what we call the Battle of Armageddon. But we can see that this, this opposition to God and his anointed is continuing. And so just to remember this, uh, just some comments back now in Psalm 2 uh, on some of the words that are used here. It's interesting. It says... Um, the people imagine a vain thing. That word imagine is the same Hebrew word that's used in Psalm 1 concerning the godly man. In verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And so the very same word that's translated uh, in the King James here as imagine is the same word as meditate in the Hebrew, in Psalm 1. And so what's the idea that he's conveying here? Well, while the godly man, the perfect man, he spends his time meditating, mulling over, uh, chewing over the word of God, just kind of getting a good understanding of God's word and his purposes. Uh, on the other hand, the people in Psalm 2, they're also laying awake at night not thinking about the word of God, but thinking about how they can be done with God, how they can get rid of God, how they can be done with the restraint that God, the God of scripture, the God of revelation brings. And so they're imagining something. They're meditating on it. They're using their imagination to meditate on how they can overthrow God. Laying awake at night, thinking how we can do this says, why do the heathen rage? That word rage is literally tumultuously assembled. It's like a riotous crowd. Just like if you follow anything of what's going on in, in, in the North America, you'll see that on the campuses, and not just there, I'm, I'm sure it's taking place in campuses in Europe as well, uh, the, 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 the mobs are there in, in tumultuous assembly. They're just kind of causing mayhem. And what, what's their opposition, really? Well, it's against Israel, but really it's against the God of Scripture. Really, that's what's behind it all. Man's hatred uh, is seen, uh, this riotous crowd, just like at Calvary. Remember at Calvary when the mob was surrounding the cross, veins sticking out on their necks. Crucify him. Crucify him was their cry. That's the idea of the heathen raging. And it's not just the political powers of this world which have no desire to be ruled by him. There's scarcely a commercial or intellectual or cultural interest anywhere on earth which would not resent Christ's claims upon them. This rebellion of man, the heathen raging, the people imagining a vain thing. And it's a vain thing because it's impossible. They want to do away with God and his anointed, and whatever they want to do is destined to absolute failure. It's a, it's a vain thing. It's worthless. It's not going to work. They're not going to succeed. It says in verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. Kind of interesting. They they set themselves. There's kind of this deliberate adoption of a policy. They're set on this. Uh, they're taking counsel together. Uh, they're passing resolutions. They're they're coming together. And their their kind of common resolution is this: God is dead. We don't want anything to do with him. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord. It can be rendered the rulers have gathered by appointment. Uh, the decision to do away with God is. Perhaps a United Nations resolution. I suspect that might happen someday. 
put to the vote, passed unanimously without abstentions and without vetoes, the world is formally and firmly united in its desire to get rid of the God of revelation, the Lord and his anointed. Here we read of kings who refuse to be subject to the king of kings. Their objection of their meetings uh, is basically to get rid of the God of the Bible and his son. Of course, this word anointed we've already mentioned is the word Meshach or Messiah. In Hebrew, Christos, Christ in Greek. And of course, the idea is this, that uh, in the Old Testament, uh, prophets, priests, and kings were usually anointed with oil talking about them being set apart by symbolically by the Spirit of God for a specific service. And of course, all of these three offices will be found in the Messiah, who is truly the anointed one. And so he is the one. And of course, uh, he didn't have oil put upon him, but the very thing that the oil symbolized, uh, the descent of the Spirit at his baptism, proved that he was indeed the Messiah, the anointed one. So what is their purpose? Verse 3, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. Why are they so antagonistic towards the Lord and his anointed? Well, the words that are used here, bands and cords, really give us a big clue, don't they? When we think of bands and cords, it speaks of restraint. If you have a, a big uh, pack of uh, of three by five cards with all your memory verses on, and what do you want to do to keep them together so that they don't just go all over the place? Well, you put elastic bands around them. It's to hold them together. Uh, you get uh, wood, and uh, we buy wood here, and you don't need it in Malaysia, but, but in our wintertime, we get cords of wood. And it's a group of wood that's stacked together and held together uh, in a measurement that kind of holds it all together. So this idea of bands and cords, it speaks of restraint. They want to throw away all moral restraint and the existence of God and of his Christ is a great hindrance to their moral depravity. The moral and ethical teaching of the Bible is repugnant to the rebellious human heart. And that's why they want to get rid of the Lord and his anointed. Uh, just look for a minute at Psalm 14. And, and of course, we could turn to Psalm 53 because it's almost identical. But you get the, the kind of thought here of what's going on, even with the atheists in our society. Notice here, he says in verse 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, why do they say that? Is, that, is this because of uh, intelligence that they've come to this decision? Is this because of uh, their, their brilliance mentally? No, the reason that they've come to this decision is not intellectual, it's moral. Notice what the very next phrase is. They are corrupt. They have done abominab abominable works. There is none that doeth good. You see, what God says is the reason why people come to this decision, there is no God. And what they're really saying is there is no God for me. It's because God cramps their style. <laughs> he he uh, prevents them from carrying out their corrupt desires. And so if they can get rid of him, then they can live as pervertedly as they want. Notice, by the way, it says, let us cast off their bonds, plural, their bands. Uh, let us break their bands, cast away their cords from us, recognizing the triunity of God. Uh, they, there's a recognition that this is the God of revelation that they're opposed to. They want to throw off their bands, their cords, throw off all restraint. Men today have a new system of morality. The morality which lets them do as they please without being faced with the warnings and wooings of God. Modern man 
finds wholly unacceptable what the Bible has to say about the sanctity of marriage, about sexual purity, about respect for parents, reverence for those in authority, about sin, salvation, and coming judgment. In fact, our society wants no absolutes. But when we lived in Ireland, I remember distinctly that there was a campaign that was being pushed in the country, and it, it, its its kind of key phrase was this, it's a crime to punish a child. In other words, it's criminal to restrain a child. Let him do what he wants to do. Uh, of course, if you don't restrain a child, what happens to that child? Well, if he grows up knowing no restraint, when he becomes a big child, he won't have any restraint as well. Uh, school teachers in the education system are powerless to discipline children. Evolution is taught as a fact. Sex education promotes promiscuity, experimentation, and decries abstinence. And so it, it seems that our society is very much in unity in their opposition to any kind of restraint. The reason that there's such hatred and rejection of the Lord Jesus is because people believe he's going to restrict or hinder their lives. And of course, that's really behind it all. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want anybody telling me what to do or how to live. And so that's really the heart behind it. Now, what this section here, this rebellion of man, is going to ultimately end up in the end time scenario described in Revelation 19, where basically the nations of the earth come together with this, you talk about imagining a vain thing, but their vain imaginations bring them together unitedly in war against the Lord and against his anointed. And so we'll notice, um, we'll break in um, at um, verse uh, 11. It says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. It's in Revelation 19. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true in righteousness. He doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And of course, the reason that he's seen in that way is because the nations have gathered together to make war against God, uh, bringing the world together. Uh, and it's amazing how the world will be united ultimately in the end of time uh, at this, what we call the great battle of Armageddon. Uh, the kings of the earth will make their last stand in their rebellion against heaven's king, the Lord Jesus. And of course, it's destined, as we know, to ultimate failure. So now the second stanza in verses four through six, and uh, we want to just observe here, it says, uh, he, uh, this is the father speaking and his reply, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So the, sw the, the scene switches from earth to a heavenly scene. The boasts of men do not trouble the Lord at all. It's like a squeak of a mouse against a lion. Man's nuclear weapons, his Star Wars, are like children's toys to him. He knows all their secrets and more. The Lord laughs. Now, it's not one of hilarity here, but it's of an incredulity. Uh, he, it just, it's incredible to him that man in his foolishness would ever dare to attempt to rebel against him and fight against him. Uh, he's really saying this, these people have the audacity to challenge 
me. He laughs at their puny boasts. He shall have them in derision. Hate all they want. Plan all they like. Fret and fuss all they wish. Men can never rid themselves of God. Hostility is futile. Why? God is sovereign. He sits in heaven. In other words, he transcends man. He is far superior. How does this scene of raging hostility strike him? Is he stricken with terror? Does he fly into a panic? Does he call an emergency session of the heavenly cabinet? No, he just laughs. He scoffs at puny men as they parade briefly across the stage of history, as they fume and fuss. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Verse 5, it says, Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. God is indeed revealed in Scripture as a God of love, but he also has yearned for man to respond to the entreaties of his love. But he's also a God of wrath. We hear little today, sadly, about the wrath of God. But it's definitely a theme of Scripture. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it talks about God's wrath being continuously revealed against all of man's rebellion. And so uh, Psalm 711 says God is angry with the wicked every single day. And uh, so we, we know that there's a day coming when God's wrath, which builds slowly, uh, it doesn't fly off the handle, he's very long suffering, but the day is coming when his wrath will be poured out on rebellious man. And when will that wrath take place? Well, again, the book of Revelation is really a book where the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven in a very clearly definite way. Even Revelation 6, 17 says, the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And so there's a coming time described in Revelation 6, 19. We call it the tribulation period where God's wrath is going to be revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, where he's going to pour out that wrath on mankind. And so he's going to speak to them in his wrath, vex them in his sore displeasure. And what's the purpose? He says in verse six, yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. In contrast to man's revolting claim, we will not have this man to reign over us, Luke 19, verse 14. God responds, so certain is it that Christ will reign on Mount Zion that he speaks of it as if it's already an established fact. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is God's unalterable purpose. Nothing on earth or hell or bad theology can stop it. <laughs> Jesus is going to reign from Mount Zion. The I is emphatic here. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The tone must be one of cold anger. You may conspire and rebel, but I, you see, have already decided who shall finally rule your world. I have spoken, and there's an end of it. He will reign. While they're proposing, he has disposed the matter already. Jehovah's will is done. Man's will frets and raves in vain. God's anointed is appointed and shall not be disappointed. God's anointed is appointed, shall not be disappointed. So, of course, we have to ask the question, well, where is this Mount Zion? Some would tell us that it's he's going to reign from heaven. But that's not what the psalmist understood. In fact, the psalmist would clearly understand Mount Zion to be uh, in on earth in Jerusalem. Uh, if you look, please, back with me to 2 Samuel. Uh, we'll find out about this place called Mount Zion. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. It says, The king and his men went to Jerusalem, unto the Jebusites, 
the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither. Thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And so, quite clearly, uh, the place where Messiah will reign during the millennial kingdom is the very place of his rejection. The very place where it was said, we will not have this man to reign over us. That's where the claims will be fulfilled. Let me read from Luke's gospel just for a minute, please. Luke's gospel, chapter 1, and verse 32 and 33. At his birth, we read these words that have yet to find fulfillment. Luke 1, and verse 32 and 33. It says this, And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So where's he going to reign? He's going to reign on the throne of his father David. Well, where did David reign from? Again, from Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom, there shall be no end. And so uh, Zion uh, speaks of uh, Jerusalem, uh, speaks of the temple area, uh, the entire city of Jerusalem. Uh, so many scriptures speak of this. And so this is where the Lord will reign from. And now we move on to the third stanza and uh, verses uh, seven through nine. The son speaks about his glorious reign. And so he says this, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. I will declare the decree. Now, contextually, the decree uh, here in Psalm 2 refers to the Davidic covenant in which God declared he would be a father to the king and the king would be his son. So when David became king, God described their affiliation as a father-son relationship. So the expression son took on the meaning of a messianic title. So let me give you an example of this. Again, we'll go back to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel and chapter 7 and verse 14. Well, let's, um, let's break in in verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy father, speaking of David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, speaking of Solomon. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And notice verse 14. This is key. This is the context here. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If you commit iniquity, I'll chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So I want you just to see there. So that at least in Psalm 2, originally, the original context is connected with the Davidic covenant that his descendants, like Solomon, would be enter into like a father-son relationship where God would be their father and they would be a son. And so uh, that's kind of the, the initial background to this particular psalm. But now we want to think about the messianic aspect of the psalm. And here, I believe, we have one of the eternal decrees of God made in past eternity. Jehovah, Jehovah has said to the Son, the eternal Son, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And of course, the question is, just what exactly does that mean prophetically? What is this day referring to? Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And so now, again, we go to the New Testament for help in understanding. And we need to go to the book of Acts, 
in chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 and verse 33 and 34. Where we read this, it says, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. So here we have the New Testament explanation here. He's explaining what the day is. Now, this is a sermon Paul preached in a synagogue in Antioch in Pisidia. And he's proving to them that Jesus is the Messiah by using Old Testament scripture to do it. And he states that that day refers to the resurrection of Christ. It's linked to the promise to give him the sure mercies of David. This means that Messiah would come as a descendant of David. Uh, that's the idea of the sure mercies of David. Let me ask you to go back again. Sorry, to keep taking you back there to 2 Samuel, but chapter 7 again, as we think about the sure mercies of David. 2 Samuel, again, chapter 7, verse 13. He shall build a house in my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 16. Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And so part of the, the sure mercies of David was that he would always have a descendant that would sit on the throne of Israel. Now, the only rightful person who could fulfill that promise is the Lord Jesus. In terms of genealogically, he was the only one who could be the one who would be the rightful heir to David. But what did they do? Well, the Jews took him and they killed him. So that would be a tremendous difficulty now because the legal heir, the only legal heir to the throne is dead. If Jesus is the Messiah and died and remained dead, the Davidic covenant could never be fulfilled the sure mercies of David would fail. So in what sense does begotten refer to the resurrection? This day have I begotten thee. Well, at his birth, it was a virgin womb that he came out of. At his resurrection, it was a virgin tomb that he came out of. Remember, he was laid in a place where never man had ever been laid. And that gave birth to Jesus Christ in resurrection glory. And so, although the Lord Jesus always was the eternal Son of God, the resurrection declared him to be so and secured for him those sure mercies of David. Uh, again, I want to go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4, where we read this. It says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And so two things are going on really in Acts 13. One is that his sonship, which was ever true, I believe in the eternal sonship of Christ, but his sonship was affirmed by resurrection. This day have I begotten thee. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And also at the same time, it secured forever the sure mercies of David. David will always have someone who will sit on his throne. Who will that be? Well, it'd be that one who lives in the power of an endless life. <laughs> he will sit on the throne of his father, David. Just like David was anointed before he actually began his reign. Remember uh, that he ended up in a cave uh, uh, with those that were in distress and those in debt and those that were discontented. They gathered to him in that cave. Well, the usurper was on the throne. Somebody who refused to get off the throne. 
The Lord Jesus is now seated at God's right hand, waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. Those who were loyal to David during the time of his rejection became the ruling administration when he was crowned king. We find ourselves in that day today. We are gathered to our David. We believe Jesus is the rightful king and Messiah. And we're, we're serving him in the day of his rejection. And to the extent of our loyalty to him in the day of his rejection will determine our service for him in the day of his vindication. In verse 8, we read, Ask of me, and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So here's an interesting thought again. Uh, ask of me, has the Lord Jesus ever asked? He's told to ask. Now, this is often used in missionary conferences, and it's often used as, you know, kind of uh, uh, give the heathen for your inheritance or the most parts of the earth. But it's really speaking to the son, the father speaking to the son and telling him, ask me. And I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. You're the heir. All you got to do is ask and it's yours. And yet clearly the Lord Jesus has not asked yet. When is he going to ask? Well, Revelation chapter five, that's when he's going to ask. Look at Revelation five, amazing scripture. Book of Revelation, we often use it um, rightly in our remembrance meetings, but there's really a story going on here. And in Revelation 5, uh, we see in verse 1, uh, in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof. No man in heaven on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, the four elders, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, to the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the earth. And notice, um, of course, there's an outburst of praise as a result of that. But I want you to read down now, please, and notice verse 10. It says, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. I want you to get the picture here. When is the Lord Jesus going to ask for the heathen, for his inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth? For his possession. Well, it's at this very instance in Revelation 5, where the one that sits on the throne has in his hand this seven sealed scroll. What is that seven sealed scroll? I want to suggest to you it's the title deeds to planet Earth. So, who's worthy to take it? See, the first man who was given dominion over the Earth, Adam, he wasn't up to the task. Now the question is, is there anybody out there that's even up to the job? Who could do this? Who's up to the task? Well, there is someone. He, he's the, 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 the second man, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus. He's the lamb that is overcome and is worthy. And so the Lord comes and takes that. And it, what he does, he takes the title deeds of planet Earth. And, and so that's when he's going to get his kingdom. Now there's a little bit of a difficulty. He's been given the title deeds, but there are people on this earth who are still in rebellion. And they're still saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. So how's it going to work out? He's got the title deeds to a planet, but there are squatters there. And the squatters don't want to give up the earth. They think it belongs to them. So how's he going to deal with it? And so each seal that opens we're going to see a series of judgments. Those judgments are all designed to remove the earth dwellers. Those people that think this earth belongs to them. And so all the way through the book of the Revelation, he's clearing out the squatters. He's removing the earth dwellers so that he can come and have the heathen for his inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. And so we, we would conclude this 
in a coming day, I believe it's after the rapture of the church, because I do believe that he wants to share this inheritance with his bride. And it's not till his bride is caught up there that he will ask for it. And then he will take his bride and they, and that's why we mentioned in Revelation 5 verse 10, we shall reign with him on the earth. We're going to come and reign with him. And so uh, it has his bride in view that once his bride is caught up to meet him in the air, then he's going to ask for this uh, inheritance. It says in verse 9 now, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. His enemies shall be dashed in pieces. Possession of this planet will be by conquest, by a warrior king coming from heaven. It's not going to be, as the post-millennialists would tell us, by the preaching of the gospel. It's going to come as a catastrophe to the earth. When Messiah comes with a rod of iron and dashes in pieces all of his enemies. And of course, this scripture is quoted several times in the book of Revelation, including that passage we read from Revelation 19. Maybe one further messianic psalm that has a bearing on this is Psalm 110. Let's just look there again about this warrior king who is coming to put down his enemies and to reign in righteousness. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. And so again, we see the Lord coming with this rod of iron, crushing down all opposition, all rebellion, and taking up this inheritance that he won at the cross, uh, the inheritance of the heathen, the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. So now we come to this uh, kind of climax stanza in verse 10 to 12, where the Holy Spirit begins to speak. And what he's saying is this, be wise, he says, now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. What he's saying is, be wise. He's, think, he's saying, think this thing out. Recognize the situation for what it is. Don't nurse any hope of succeeding against God. I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion, God says. Every opposition is going to be crushed. And so he's telling the kings of the earth, wise up here. Be instructed, learn here, you kings, you judges of the earth. In the light of what will certainly come to pass, how should a person respond wisely? He says to the kings and judges of the earth, learn a lesson from this, respond to this. You know, God takes no pleasure in judging men. He would rather save them than judge them. And so what he's saying is, wise up. Think about this message. Think that it's a hopeless cause that you're involved with. And, and uh, just kind of recognize it. Wise up. And then he tells him, this is what you should do, verse 11. He says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. The rulers are meant to be God's ministers anyway, aren't they? Isn't that what the New Testament tells us? That these, those that are, are, are these people that are, uh, raised up to be government officials. They're, 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 New Testament calls them ministers. They're supposed to serve him. Serve the Lord. Don't, don't fight against him. Serve the Lord with fear. You're meant to be a minister of God. Sadly, so many of them today are fighting against God. When you're on the losing side, the best thing to do ultimately is wise up, know you have no chance of winning, and just lay down your arms and surrender. And verse 12, he says this, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Kiss the son. Look at First Samuel again. Now First Samuel chapter 10. First Samuel chapter 10 and verse 1. It says, then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon the head 
on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And so really a kind of a reference back to this incident where Samuel recognized who God's anointed was and showed his allegiance to the new king by kissing him. And so that's the thought here. Kiss the son. Give your allegiance to the rightful king. Submit to him before it's too late. That's why Judas' kiss was such a mockery. There was a sign of allegiance, but in his case, it was an act of betrayal. It says, kiss the son lest he be angry with thee. We don't want to face the anger of God. You remember, this is the one who has a rod of iron. He will crush all opposition. When his wrath is kindled but a little. And that's all that will be necessary. Despite all of the armies of earth being gathered together, Martin Luther puts it this way, just one word will fell him. <laughs> yeah, just it, 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 it's not going to take a lot. Uh, just his wrath is kindled, but a little. It, it won't take much for God to destroy and put down all rebellion, all authority that's against him. It'll only take a little bit. God offers man peace, not war. He will not force his love and mercy upon those who are determined to rebel. Before waging war, he offers conditions of peace. What are the conditions of peace? Kiss the sun lest he be angry with you. Those who refuse to submit will someday be cut off while they're still walking in the way of rebellion. They'll be going along in their hatred, spewing out their venom against God, and he will step in and cut them off and send them into eternity. In short, we're presented with this option concerning Christ. Cherish or perish. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with thee. Ye sinners seek his grace, whose wrath you cannot bear. Fly to the shelter of his cross and find salvation there. So this concludes our consideration of Psalm 2. And isn't it an encouragement to us in the light of what we see today on the campuses, men's rebellion against God? In every way, why are they so hostile towards Israel? Are they the only people that have done things like Israel have done? I mean, you look around the world, there's all kinds of things happening. But Israel always makes the news. And the reason is because of that two-letter word at the end of the word Israel, El. Their very existence is testament to the living God. And that's why they're hated so much because in a sense it's a way of getting at God and his anointed who will come to us as the king of Israel and it's good to know tonight all their efforts are destined to fail because Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth its successive journeys run what a day that will be even so come Lord Jesus amen Thank you so much, Brother Mike. I'm sure we have all been greatly encouraged and inspired. These words, 3,000 years old, but I think they are even more relevant today than they were the, the year in which they were written. Mm -hmm. There's one recurrent theme, and that is God will vindicate his son. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Acts chapter 2, God hath made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The very reasons for rejecting the Lord Jesus, his lordship and his messiahship, did not go unnoticed before God, and he will vindicate his son. And how wonderful it was in Acts chapter 2 that, that those who recognize that vindication and came to him for salvation 
but one way or another, every knee shall bow. Um, wherever that knee is, every knee shall bow. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, brother, for your efforts and your your um your fellowship with us in this way. And thank 